it's nice to say that Elul is the time to prepare for the Yemei Adin. Question is, though, other than the words itself, what does that mean? In what way is it that that practically plays itself out? Now, there's an interesting difference between the way the tour introduces uh, Elul and the way the Machaber introduces Elul. The tour, when he introduces Elul, he gives the background to the historical context, and then he moves on to the halacha. And in the halacha, he mentions the minag of Yisrael, that they start getting up early and they say slichas. And also he points out that the have the tradition that they start blowing shayfa. Machaber, however, in the same exact simon, in Tav Kuf Pei Aleph, also introduces Elul by pointing out that we say Slichas and Tachanun, that we get up early to start saying Slichas, but he makes no mention whatsoever of the blowing of the Shefer. The Ramah, immediately on the spot, points out that the Minag of Ashkenaz is that we don't get up, we don't start saying Slichas on Rosh Chodesh Elul, we only start on the Sunday before Rosh Hashanah with all the technicalities that go into that. And also makes mention of the fact that we blow Shefer already starting Rosh Chodesh Elul. And this omission of the Mechaber, of the tradition to blow Shefer, especially when it comes off of the tour not omitting it, requires some sort of clarification. Why is it that the tour does mention it and why is it that the Mechaber does not mention it? And this is something that we have to, we have to look into. And maybe if we could figure out what it is exactly that the Mechaber is seeing that the tour, what it is that the tour is seeing that the Mechaber is not, maybe that will give us a little bit of insight into what El means from a practical point of view for us. But I want to introduce, before we get to the, to the discussion of the Mechaber and the Tur, I want to introduce yet another concept, which I think requires a little bit of discussion. And that is as follows. Rabbeinu HaKadosh, when he closed the Shas, which is with Meseches Uktsin, the very, very last line of all of Shas in the writing of the Mishnah, the very last Mishnah of the very last Perak, of the very last Masechta, of the very last Seder in Shas, Rabbi HaKadosh quotes a member from Rabbi Shimon ben Chalafta, and he says, Omar Rabbi Shimon ben Chalafta, Ein lecha kli machzik bracha el shalem. There's no utensil, there's no vessel for better holding bracha than that of shalom. And he quotes a pasuk, Shnemar Hashem Oizlam Yitein Hashem Yivarech Esamei Basham. And that's the way Rabbeinu Hakadosh felt it was necessary to close the discussion of Teresh Malka. We find a very similar ending. The Gemara falls over a Maisa about a group of Chaveirim, a group of Rabbonan who gathered together to be Ma'abr the Shana. And after having all of the discussions that went into that, the Gemara closes by saying, the Amdu Misham Beneshika. And they got up from that gathering Beneshika, which literally means with a kiss. And the Mepharshim explained what that means is, Va'amdu Misham B'neshika means that Kesha'amdu, when they finished their debate or their calculations, whatever it was, but when they finished Kesha'amdu, Haya B'neihem Ahava V'achva. When they got up, what was there, what, what existed among all of those Chachamim who had convened was a state of Shalom. And that's what the Gemara means when it says, Va'amdu Misham B'neshika. 
And so here too, you see that at the closing of a certain debate, or at the closing of what could have been and probably was a very heated discussion regarding the technicalities of Ibar HaChaydesh and all sorts of other technicalities, where some vicious words had been said. The person quoted Rabbi Akiva, he got blasted for misquoting Rabbi Akiva. It was pretty, pretty vicious stuff going on over there. Nonetheless, the Gemara closes by saying, when they all got up, that what existed among them was a state of friendship, a state of brotherhood. So that the closing of the debate, the closing of this technical discussion or whatever it was, was also that there should be a state of shalom. And so there seems to be some need to describe the closing of anything, really, but there seems to be some need to describe a state of shalom that exists or that is meant to exist in Klal Yisrael, among the Chachamim, between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Yisrael, by Matzah HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Kli Machzik Brocha, El HaShalom. There seems to be some need for us to close the discussions using shalom as our closure. And so I want to talk a little bit about what it means that we should be in a state of shalom. What that means, that Kodesh Baruch Hu doesn't find a vessel to hold bracha, yeyesim in shalom. Why is it that the Chachamim were so, why it was so important to the Chachamim that there should be this state of ava, the achva, between them? And I think the answer lies in a source for what happened on El, in Elul that the tour does not bring. The tour, in his introduction to Elul, he quotes the Tanad Ve, the Pirkei Rabbi Eliezer, the Pirkei Rabbi Eliezer and Perik Mem Bav. And the Pirkei Rabbi Eliezer has a whole discussion of what it is exactly that happened on Reish Chaydesh Elul, and we'll get to that in a moment. But there is yet another source for seemingly the same event that appears in the Tonad Ve'elio Zuta in Perek Dalid. And there it's slightly different. In the Tonad Ve'elio Zuta, it says as follows, that Moshe Rabbeinu went back up to Har Sinai in order to receive the last set of luchas, the second set of luchas, on Rosh Chodesh Elul. And on that day, all of Kala Yisrael fasted. And then again, when Moshe Rabbeinu came down, all of Kala Yisrael fasted. And the Torah Be'elio adds in one sentence at the end, and he says, Velonu Nisan. They even extended the fast so that it included the night before, so that they also slept the night before in the state of fasting. Kedei Shaloi Yishleit Bohem Yetzer Hora. Those are the words that the Tonad Velio adds. The Pirkei Rebbe Eliezer does not have these words. The Pirkei Rebbe Eliezer talks about something else, which, I, like I said, we'll discuss in a moment. But the Tonad Velio points out that the point of Lonu Betanisa, the point of the fast that they, that they did, both at the commencement of Moshe Rabbeinu going up to the mountain, and also when he came back down with the second Luchas, was... So that the Yitzhahara should not have any control over them. Now, I don't want to get into the whole explanation for what it is about fasting and the lack of shlit of the Yitzhahara. That's, that's not the direction I want to go. I want to go, though, into this idea of that a person should be somehow able to transcend the demands and the insistence of all of those things that we associate with Yetzirah. Because although there is a very well-known mission in Pirkei Oves that tells us that he that a person has the tools by which to avoid Aveira, all he has to do is be mistakal b'shloisha dvarim, where you come from, where you're going to end up, 
and before whom you're ultimately going to have to give an accounting for all of your actions. That the Mishnah says, just simply pay attention to those three facts. And then if you can be aware of those three facts, you will probably not involve yourself in Aveira. That's a well-known Mishnah. What is it that a person should do in order to, to avoid in order to avoid doing an Aveira? What is less known is, is that our Chachamim also told us what it is that a person would do, which would definitely lead him into Aveira. And this is a memra of Rava. This is a statement that Rava makes in the Gemara on the Braisa in Meseches Kala, Perigvav, the first Braisa in Perigvav. So on that Braisa, which there also, instead of it being Shloisha Dvarim, Histakal B'Shloisha Dvarim, there the Braisa has Histakal Ba'arba Dvarim. But the Gemara over there says as follows, Omar Rava. In the same way that Midas Harachamim has these four things, that is to say that a person who is able to observe these things can avoid Aveira, in exactly the same way the Af HaSatan, also the Satan has his four ways to make sure that you will do an Aveira. This is less known, probably because it's more important that we are Mistach of B'Shalei Varm in order to avoid Aveira and not find out what it is that makes us yes do Aveira. Nonetheless, our Chachamim have also taught us what it is that will definitely put us straight into the hands of the Yetzirah. And what are those four things? So the Brice enumerates them. And the last one is the Hariv. And contention, conflict. A person who is in a state, a person who allows himself to be in a state of conflict, that is the means by which the Satan gets him. And that is a definite way by which a person will, yes, which tells us that there is some sort of association between conflict and Avera, which of course by extension means that the reverse would also be true. That somehow being in a state of Shalom allows you to avoid the snare of the Satan. And so somehow or another, if Reed is the means by which one is yes, Shailet, the Yetzirah is yes, Shailet on him, then it follows that Shalom would be yet another way that the Yetzirah would not be Shailet on him. Does everybody understand that? Again, let's go through what I'm saying. Let's go through the steps. The Braisa says, Rava says that in the same way Midas Harachamim has its ways, in exactly the same way the Satan has his ways. What's the Midas Harachamim's way? Me'ayin Basa, where you came from, Lo'anato Heilech, Mifnei Mi'ato Sidli Tendin V'Cheshbon. Those are the Midas Harachamim's way to avoid the Shlita, to avoid the drives and the insistence of the Yetzirah. Says Rava, the Satan also has his tools. And one of those tools is the Reed, conflict, contention. That means that conflict and contention are a tool by which a person would be yes under the authority, let's call it, of the Yetzirah. It follows, therefore, that the lack thereof, meaning the avoidance of Reed and the avoidance of conflict and contention, would be yet another means, what we call shalom, would be yet another means by which the Yetzahara would not be shalom on a person. And so, again, we see that we have to figure out what exactly is the shalom deal, because now it's just taken one step forward. It's gone more than just being a kli machzik bracha, but it's become now a kli by which one could avoid all that would take away from his ability to have bracha. Bearing all that in mind, 
Let's make our way back to the tour and to the machaba. The tour doesn't quote the Tanit Ve'elio, like I said. The tour quotes the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. And the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer says as follows, On Rosh Chodesh Elul, Moshe Rabbeinu went back up the mountain in order to receive the second set of luchas. And they blew Shefer in the encampment in order to make the announcement that Moshe Rabbeinu was going back up the mountain. That's the way the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer puts it. And the Torah quotes this as being the description of what happened. He does not describe it the way the Tonad Velio describes it. He describes it the way the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer describes it. Doesn't make any mention of the fast. Instead, he focuses on the Tekiyas, on the Tekiyas Shefer. Then the tour goes on and quotes yet another pasuk that to prove that Kia Shafer is anyhow a means by which people are drawn to do teshuva. Asks the Beis Yosef, who is also the Machaber, why is it necessary for the tour to bring down two psukim? Two reasons. The first reason should have sufficed. On Rosh Chodesh El, Moshe went up the mountain. And so they blew Shafer in the Machana in order to make the announcement, in order to make the proclamation that Moshe Rabbeinu had gone up the mountain. Then the tour goes on and says, furthermore, the Basak says, if a shofar sound shall be heard in the city, will the people not be frightened? To show that Shafer and Teshuvah are associated. Says the Beis Yasef, why does the tour need to quote the second Pasuk when he already gave a very valid explanation for the Tkia Shefer on Rosh Chaydesh the one in which he said that they blew the Shefer in order to make the proclamation that Moshe Rabbeinu went up the mountain. Answers the Beis Yosef, because had it been only based on Moshe Rabbeinu's going up the mountain, then it would have sufficed had they just made a proclamation. The Lushen of the Beis Yosef is it would have been just as good if they simply would have let forth the proclamation. Moshe Rabbeinu has gone up the mountain. There's no need for an actual Tekiah Shefer. The Mela says the Beis Yosef, in order to explain why the Torah brings down the Pasuk of, if a shofar sound shall be heard, because the Beis Yosef says, good, the fact that they blew the Shefer when Moshe Rabbeinu went up the mountain is really not relevant, because it, it could have just as well been accomplished by having a proclamation. Mamela, you need yet another explanation for the blowing of the show. That's what the Beis Yasef says. Which means that the Beis Yasef doesn't take the blowing of the Shafer when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to the mountain as being operative. Other reasons. Masha Inke in the tour, quoting the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, obviously does see the blowing of the Shafer as being operative. The Rambam, famous Rambam, Nilchus Tshuva and Peregimel, has told us multiple times. When I say multiple, I don't mean that the Rambam wrote it multiple, but I mean we've seen it so many times that we can call it multiple times. The Rambam writes, as everybody knows, even though that the blowing of Shefer on Rosh Hashanah is Xer Sakosov, Remez Yeshbay. Nonetheless, there is meaning in this Gzeir Sakasif. And what is the meaning? Says the Rambam, the meaning is Uru Yeshenim Mishinaschem. Awaken. Awaken those of you who are sleeping, awaken from your slumber and start looking closely at your actions. People who get caught up, Bahavle Hazman, who get caught up in the silliness that overtakes them with time and their shagim kol yimeyem, they waste all of their lives in silliness and waste. Now is the time to look carefully at your actions and to take stock. So is the Rambam, that's the meaning, the, the remez that lies behind the gzeir sakosav of tkiya shayfa. Uru 
Now, if we could imagine that the reason why they blew Shafer in the Machane was not merely as a means of announcement that Moshe Rabbeinu was going up the mountain, but was also meant to be an announcement of what Klal Yisrael's responsibilities down at the bottom of the mountain are while Moshe Rabbeinu has gone up the mountain. And the point of the blowing of the shofar was twofold. A, so as to make the announcement that Moshe Rabbeinu has gone up the mountain, but B, and perhaps more importantly, good. So Moshe Rabbeinu is going up the mountain. He's going to go get the second luchas, but we, what are we supposed to do? Are we just supposed to continue living our lives while Moshe Rabbeinu was up on the top of the mountain receiving the second luchas? What are we supposed to be doing down here at the bottom of the mountain? And so they blew the shofar. They blew the shofar because the point of the blowing of the shofar was to allow them to know what their job is while Moshe Rabbeinu was up there on top of the mountain. Moshe Rabbeinu is going to be up there on top of the mountain. He'll take care of his job. Good, that's his job, your job. Your job is exactly like the Rambam says, the remez yeshbay, the remez that is inherent in the blowing of the shofar, which is uru yishenem mitir damaschem, to awaken. The chipsu b'maaseichem, and to start looking carefully at your lives. And everybody who gets involved in silliness and wastefulness, focus on it. Start addressing what it is that your life is made up of. If that's why they chose specifically to blow the shofar and not to have merely a proclamation that Moshe Rabbeinu has gone up the mountain, then that would explain very well why the tour brings down the minig to blow shofar on Rosh Chodesh Elul, while as the Mechaber does not. The Mechaber who sees the Pirkei Drebel as only being the explanation for the proclamation Moshe Rabbeinu is going up the mountain, and therefore the Beis Yisuf says, no, they could have just as well made done, made do with an actual proclamation. Mimele, he doesn't see the blowing of the shofar on Rosh Chodesh Elul as being an operative element of what was going on. Mimele, he doesn't bring it down in the Shulchan Aruch as what it is that we do. Mashiach King, the Torah understand that it wasn't just a means by which to make a proclamation, but rather was a twofold, a twofold tool. One, to make them mock proclamation, but the other, to inform Klai Yisrael what their responsibilities are while Moshe Rabbeinu is up in the mountain. Memele says the tour, is that not the same now? And so Memele, he brings down the minig that we have to blow Shefer, even during, from Rosh Chodesh Elul and on. And so with this, perhaps we could explain why it is that the Mechaber omitted this point, while as the tour did bring it down. which tells us that when it comes to what we are supposed to be doing during Elul, is that we are supposed to be focusing on the Hevel of Zman. And I want to talk a little bit about what the Hevel of Zman means. The Hevel of Zman means as follows. Did you guys say Birkas HaChodesh this week in shul? Well, did you guys have shul to go to? Some of you? Yeah? Some of you not, some of you, yeah. You said Birkas HaChodesh? In Birkas HaChodesh, what do we say? Chaim Aruchim, Chaim Shol Shalom, Chaim Shol Teva, Chaim Shol Bracha, Chaim Shol Parnasa. All those things we mean very, very much. Then we start talking about other things. Chaim she'esh ben avas teira v'yira shamayim. Chaim she'en ben busho uchlima. Chaim she'loyshir v'chavay, that everybody means. Chaim she'tehei banu ahavas teira v'yira shamayim. Chaim she'en bahem chait. There are so many different things that we're asking for, some of which we really truly 
relate to, and some of which are things that are aspirations, but we don't actually relate to them as deeply. I'll give you an example, which is a free example. It's one that no one can get touchy about. Chaim shal chilutzatzomes. We're all young and healthy, so we have chaim shal chilutzatzomes. But I'll tell you, my grandfather in his 90s, the doctor said to him, you know, Rabbi, you have to, you have to move around a little bit. You have a good heart, your heart's doing well, whatever you've been doing, keep on doing it. But you have to move around a little bit. So they, in, in his house, in the hallway, we connected these railings and you would take a walk in the house up and down the hallway holding onto the rails. And you would come and go and come and go and come and go. And after however many times he was able to do it, he would come back and he would say, ah, Chaim shal chilutz atzomais. Said to him, he really meant it. Chaim shal chilutz atzomais. He was making a joke. His name was Chaim. So he meant Chaim, who's busy doing chilutz atzomais. But the point is, is that this is one that no one can get touchy about. We don't really relate to Chaim shal chilutz atzomais. In exactly the same way, there are so many things that we say there that although we believe them to be aspirations, and although we truly wish that they were the way we were going to live our lives, nonetheless, we relate to them very, very differently. Chaim shal oisher v'chavad that we all relate to very, very well. Chaim sheish ben avas teira v'yira shamayim. Chaim sheish ben yiras chait. Those are nice things, we wish. Halavai but we don't relate to them as much. And why is that? Because the hevel of Zman overtakes us. The hevel of Zman stops us from being able to live the life that is the real life that we wish to live. Not because we're bad people, and not because we don't have Yira Shemaim, and not because we don't wish to have Yira Shemaim, we do. It's just that our lives are so filled with noise and clatter and responsibilities and what we call Aveda Sanachash, all of the tedium that makes up our lives, that what naturally happens is, is that all of those things just fade away and become background. And the noise and the clatter becomes the foreground. And so when we get caught in the hevel of the Zman, it's not because we want to be caught in hevel of Zman. It's just, that's how life leads us. And so we don't really have the chance to free ourselves from the hevel of Zman, the silliness of living our lives, to the degree that would allow us to actually live our lives the way we wish we could. One could almost say, we don't really have our own lives. Something else has our own lives. That something else that has our own lives is the hevel of Zman. And it's very difficult to avoid it. I would even go so far as to say that it might be impossible to avoid it. But nonetheless, it is the Hevel of Zman. But the Hevel of Zman steals from us our own lives. We're all kidnapped by the Hevel of Zman. And in the same way that a kidnapping is against your will, in exactly the same way, the Hevle Hazman that take away from your ability to live your life for real is a kidnapping. Nonetheless, we do have moments where we're able to steal back our lives for example, Shabbos. Shabbos for many of us is an opportunity to take back our lives away from the Hevel. Yom Tov is sometimes an opportunity to take our lives back. 
But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that when the Rambam is talking about those who are caught up in the Hevle Hazman, he's not necessarily describing a person who has relinquished his desires to be not a sleeping and slumbering person. He's a person who has been kidnapped by the Hevle Hazman. If we're correct in what we're saying, that the reason why the tour sees Tkiah Shafer as being so operative is because he understood that the Tkiah Shafer that went on in the time of the Midbar was a twofold Tkiah Shafer, not only proclaiming Moshe Rabbein was going up to the mountain, but also proclaiming to Klal Yisrael what their responsibility throughout that time period is meant to be. And on the basis of that, takes it and translates it to us even nowadays, which is why we have the minig of blowing shofar on Elul, that means that the point of Elul is that it is meant to be a time in which we are killing back our own lives, taking it away from the thievery and the kidnapping of Hevle Azma, where a person can have a short period of his year where he is actually living the life that he wants to live. Where he wrestles back from the kidnapper that which is really his. And I understand, and we all understand, that this can't be something that we're going to have the whole entire year. Because like I said, the Hevel Yazman is the way that the world works. Hevel Havoli Makol Hevel, it is. That is the way that Elam Haza works. Nonetheless, for a short period, just for a little bit, to have a moment in the year, a time in the year, in which the entire focus is not to get caught up in Hevle Azman and not to have it stolen away from you by the Hevle Azman, is what the month of Elul was then and what it is now. Memela says the tour, since this is why they blew the shafer when Moshe Rabbein went up the mountain on Rish Chaydash El, then that's why we blow the shafer now on Rish Chaydash El. Which tells us that this is the practical aspect of El. The practical aspect of El is to get a taste even if it's just for a short period of time, of what real life is what it is, what real life is like when one is able to live it. All of those things that normally fade into background. All of those things, instead of them being background, now become foreground. This is the Chaim that I want. This is the Chaim that I'm going to live. Just for a little bit. To be totally and utterly living the life that is really your life. Not a life that is stolen away from you by all of the Hevle Hazman. And now notice an interesting thing. All forms of reed, all forms of contention, of conflict, are all part of Hevle Hazman. The proof of it being that when the conflict had nothing to do with Hevle Hazman, indeed, Amdu Misham Beneshika. But reeve, contention, argument, fighting, all of those things that we associate with true conflict are all direct outgrowths of Hevle Hazman. Hevle Hazman is what gives Shlita to the Yetzirah and reeve, and Shlita of the Yetzirah and reeve is Hevle Hazman, 
They become almost synonymous with each other. Just think about it. The shlita that the Yitzhahara has on you, which is the lack of Yira Shemaim and Yira Shchit, which is the lack of Avas Teira, the Yira Shemaim. The Hevle Azman, its shlita that it has over you, is what causes for the Yitzhahara to have shlita over you. It's what causes all read. There is no read outside of Hevle Azman. Just think about it. Any reev that has no association to Havle Azman is not a reev at all. It's Sholem. Amdu Misham bin Ashika. And so we could almost go so far as to say that Sholem is a description of what living my life for real really is. Does everybody see the steps that I just took? If Reev and the Shlit of the Yetzirah is all a direct outgrowth of Hevle Hazman, then that means that the absence of Reev, the absence of the Shlit of the Yetzirah is where there is no Hevle Hazman. Which means that Shalom, the state of Shalom, is the state in which a person is not being controlled by Hevle Hazman, but rather he controls what his life is. He has wrestled it away. And so Mamela, a person who is in a state of Shalom, has there is no Shlit of the Yitzhahara over him. Does everybody see? The connection, yes? Does everybody understand the connection? Now listen to this incredible Pasuk in Tehillim. Shalom Rav Lo'ohave Seira Secha, which means what? There is great Shalom for those who love the Torah. Ve'ein Lomay Michshal, and they have no stumble. And the question is obvious. What does the end of the Pasuk have to do with the beginning of the Pasuk? Shalom Rav and therefore Ein Lahem What's the Shaykhiz? How does the end of the Pasuk connect back to the beginning of the Pasuk? Lav Seifa Reisha Lav Reisha Seifa. But Lefi Dvareinu, it's perfect. Indeed, if a person has achieved the state of Shalom, then Ein Lahem Michshal, because there's no Shlit of the Yitzhahara. So there's no michshol in Avera. So sholem rav le'ohav e'sir ha'secha memela ve'en lo me'n michshol. That's exactly what David HaMelech is describing. And so if we're going to make a, like a, a flow chart here, we'll put it like this. Where there's no reed, there's no yetzahara. Where there's no yetzahara, there's no michshol. And no reeve is the equivalent of Shalem. So Shalem leads directly to the Elomai Michshal. That's the flow chart. And so Memela, the entire focus of what Elul is, namely to be able to wrestle back your own life from the kidnapper called Hevle Azman is really just the pursuit of the state of Shalom. That's what it is. To be in a state of Shalom. Which is why the word for Shleimus and the word for Shalom is indeed the same concept. There's no conflict. The closing of our tefillah mimics all the other closings. It mimics the clothing, closing of Shas. It mimics the closing of that great debate. The closing of our tefillah is the bracha of Sholem. Sim Sholem Teva Uvracha. Now in that tefillah, we have one of the strangest sentences ever. And I don't know how many of you have picked up on the strangeness of this sentence, but I'm going to speak it out and you'll hear how strange it is. 
We say as follows, Borcheinu avinu kulonu keechot ba'or ponecha. That's a nice thing. Give us a bracha that we should experience or ponecha. Is that a nice bracha? Is that a nice request? Yes? Why? Why is it nice? Because the or ponim of Hashem is very nice, no? No. Our Anshik Nesag felt the need to explain it. Ki, here's why. Ki, bo or ponecha, nasat olonu, Hashem olekeinu, teres chayim, davas chesed. What? Where else do we ever find why it is that something is a good bracha? You guys, everybody likes, uh, I don't know, let's come up with another one. Anyone. Um, why? 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 Uh, key, uh, goliath, uh, will come. No, no need to explain it. It's fine. Okay, fine. Bad example. How about this one? Slach lonu avinu ki chatanu v'chal lonu malkinu ki fashanu. Why? Why? Because we don't want to go to hell. No, 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 no. No need to explain it. It's all clear. Okay, okay, okay. Not that one. Okay, you guys don't like that one. How about this one? Borei choleinu Hashem alekeinu sashon nazeis. That you guys all like, right? Give me money. Why? Why? What do you mean, why? <laughs> you know very well why. No, no, you have to explain why. Tell me why. Tell me why you want it. Because uh, I want to buy a Maserati. Okay, so then say it. Speak it out. Key, if you give me a lot of money, I'll be able to buy a Maserati. No, no need to say that. Which seems to be the most obvious thing to ask for. Here we have to explain it. For years and years and years, I used to fly through those lines because I just hated them so much. I said them because Anshik Nesadilo told me that I had to say them. But that wasn't the Iker. The Iker is, of course, then if you can get through the words quickly, then you get to them. Oh, fine, now we're back to normal tefillah again. What is this kibo or panecha? The answer is because our Anche Knesset Agdailu recognize that they have to explain to you what the point of a bracha for Shalom is. The point of a bracha for Shalom is that you should be able to live your life for yourself, your real life, what you really want. Sim Shalom, why? Borcheinu avinu kulanu kechol bar panecho, why? I'll tell you why. Because without it, you're caught in Hebrei Hazman. And so what Elul is for the year, the bracha of Sim Shalom is for our tefillah. That's a very different approach to what it means when we say Sim Shalom. What we're asking for is Hashem, give me the ability to live my life. That it shouldn't be stolen away from me. That it shouldn't be kidnapped from me. And that's an unbelievable, unbelievable feeling. This is the practical part of El. Is it easy? No, of course not. But do you see what a person's life could be like if he would, even if it's just for a short month, be able to live his life not having it stolen away by Hevle Hasman? Would it be a shock that the end of a month like that would lead to a Yom Kippur? Not at all. Mamela says the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, they blew Shafer when Moshe Rabbeinu went up the mountain. Mamela says the tour that there is a minig that we blow Shafer. And this is the minig that we have called El, where we spend our El trying to escape the clutches of Hevle Hazma. 
so that for a short while, just for a short while, we could be living our lives. What we want our lives to be. <clears throat> this Sunday is the last year in this series. This month starts next week, and with this we are closing what was almost a six-month period, right? Almost six months of Sunday night shearing, of which I think we missed only two. It was probably one of the most difficult periods that most of us have ever gone through, and definitely one of the most interesting periods that we have gone through. And so I just want to close with this. Since we're closing, we're closing what to me was a very significant experience and a very significant opportunity to be able to go through this time sharing with you guys the way we have. We have to be Ahmed bin Ashika. We have to make sure that as we close, we close in a state of Ava and Ahva that there is shalom between all of us. In the same way that Teresh Baal Peh closes with shalom, in the same way that the Beit close with shalom, this series also has to close with shalom. And so guys, have a wonderful, wonderful Elul, and have a wonderful, wonderful Rosh Hashanah. I'm sure I'll speak to a lot of you beforehand, but if I don't, all of you should have a great Rosh Hashanah. And you should be zeiche to actually escape the heavenly asman. And Hashem Yivorech as Amri Bashalom. I'll see you all whenever. Thank you very much. I'll see you guys. I'll see you, Kresman, next week. Or actually, this week, right? Yeah, three days. Yeah, if there's not, an, if there's not enough coffee, there ain't going to be no shalom. I'm just telling you that right now. I'll make sure to show them. All right, very good. <laughs>